trickle in here. No problem. Uh, do you know if Chris is going to be around or Ron? Um, Ron just called me. I believe he's going to jump on. And I know Chris got his second vaccine yesterday, so I'm not sure how he's feeling. You might be running the show alone. Okay. We'll find I had out. Absolute, I had absolutely no issues with the vaccine. Um, I had a sore arm for about 16 hours, and that was it. Yeah, it seems like everyone, I felt the same way. I feel like everyone's, everyone's had their own vaccine journey, as I like to call it. I had more of an issue with the Shingrix uh, vaccine for uh, shingles. Oh, than really? I did with, yeah, than I did with the um, um, the COVID deal. Yeah. Vicki, can you hear us? I don't know if you're, you may have to press star six if you're on the phone. Uh, I can hear you. Can you you're hear there. me? We can, hello. And Thank Susan, you. same question to you. Can you hear us and vice versa? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Okay. I guess in an effort of time, I might leave. It's okay. Let's just kind of start with some introductions. I am recording. Uh, this is Miranda, Miranda Fisher. I'm the Deputy Town Administrator, Town Clerk, and I support Envision 2030 from an administrative standpoint. So I'll start with our guests first. So Vicki, do you want to just introduce yourself and maybe what you're interested in learning about tonight? Uh, yes, Vicki Poe. Um, we own the Delhi building on 1st Street and actually Ron uh, left us a voicemail two weeks ago saying there was going to be a meeting of I think was last week's meeting about a loading dock on 1st Street. At the time, this was the only meeting I could find. So I'm just logging in to see what I can find out. I'm happy to email you the information. It was It's a, a grant that we're looking at that would um, bring about loading dock. I'll email you information about that in addition sure. to this meeting. Susan, you wanna go next? Um, Susan Wagner, I live on a mining claim on the southern border of the town on Big Springs. On uh, uh, The address is Magnolia, but it's on the south side of town. Um, I'm here for a couple of reasons. I, I want to hear what the committee's thinking in terms of economic development and um, municipal government. Uh, I was a little bit concerned about this mention of home rule, and I want to hear um, what people think about Netherlands' capacity to make all their own the little bit that I understand about home rule, it would put even more responsibility and burden on the the volunteers that we get to run for the board and so on. And anyway, so we I can talk about that later, but that, that's my interest. And also the IGA, I very much support uh, renewing the IGA for another 20 years. And I've been concerned at what I see as a, a gap between the leadership of the town and most of the community, you know, a lot of people don't ever come to these meetings. So the people who do come tend to be people with some particular interest, often a financial interest. And I'm concerned about how um, I just want to continue saying, I think the community wants to keep our town development inside the borders and not have large developments outside. So th those are my interests, but I, I really want to hear what the people on the committee have been talking about and thinking about. Perfect. Uh, so Scott is, is kind of an honorary new member of this committee, but Scott, would you like to introduce yourself? Love to. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Scott Papich. I live on 3rd Street. Um, I just got involved with the committee here in the last week and a half to 10 days, I suppose. And <clears throat> Vicki, Susan, welcome to the meeting. I'm glad to meet you finally. Um, you know, what we, my interest is in developing in a smart way. There, there are things that are going to happen in this town over the course of the next year, two, five, ten years. And I'm concerned that if we don't get involved and give our feedback and try and guide the process to some degree, then things will happen in a way um, that we don't wish for. Um, I'd rather be part of the solution than... <laughs> part of the place where things are happening that we don't have any say in. So I appreciate your feedback. And this is how I got started in this committee too, is by providing my feedback. Perfect. And Lee, would you like to go next? 
That's fine. Um, I guess I'm the only committee, uh, uh, original committee member here uh, for whatever reason. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of issues um, uh, that face Netherland in the next 10 years. I've been trying to direct um, thought toward the downtown area um, because I think that's the next area that's going to see uh, the most change in the next 10 years. And I think we need to be ready for it. And then uh, just Karen, and so I will say Ron is working on getting on. Julie. Oh, good. Um, oh, good. Karen, do you want to go? Next? Sure. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Karen. Um, my bandwidth is not so good at home, so I'm not having my video on because I tend to freeze. Uh, I know everybody except Vicki. Vicki, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm very interested in hearing the conversation. And as always, Miranda and I will be a resource for you um, and help, help to answer any questions that we can. Thank you. So Lee, my, my plan was then to turn it over to you. I have the document queued up and ready if you'd like me to share my screen, however you'd like to move forward. Well, that's fine. I, I mean, I'm, I'm here uh, basically just to answer questions that the public may have. Um, Concerning uh, the government and the and the economic uh, development of um, of Netherland, Netherland is a small town, as we know, and and um, you know uh, uh, the home rule uh, uh, versus versus what we have now, the IGA. Uh, that um, that is a question that. Um, we haven't really come to a decision on, but uh, as a committee, but uh, except to say that we should look at it. Uh, the, the goal should be to, um, you know, weigh the positives and negatives of remaining in the IGA with Boulder as opposed to uh, Boulder County as opposed to going off on our own. Um, and And so we haven't really come to a hard decision on that, uh, but our our um, idea is to get public feedback as to what uh, the public thinks about that. Uh, there's advantages to both, um, and and also the IGA could be modified. Um, currently, the IGA, I believe, from what Chris said, uh, Chris Larson said doesn't allow us to annex any property that's adjacent to Ned. Um, there's a couple of uh, properties. Ali, can I just, this is Karen, can I just clarify what that means? Right. It doesn't mean that they can't annex. What it means is that in addition to going through the annexation process that the town outlines in our municipal code, they also have to go through Boulder County's planning department and get approval from the commission, the Boulder County commissioners. So they would start with the town, go through the planning commission, through the public process, through our BOT. Then it would go to the county, go through their planning department, go through their commissioners and public hearings. Then if they approve, then it would come back to the planning commission and go back through the BOT. So it's not that they can't do it. It's just that Boulder County plays a very robust role in um, the analysis and approval of any annexations. Well, I get I get that, Karen. But uh, I mean, basically, in my mind, that means that you can't annex um, because Boulder County is is pretty restrictive. Um, so I'm not saying one way or the other that it's good or bad, but is something we should we should definitely be talking about uh, because the IGA. Hi, let me add you in. Hold on one moment. Uh, I think the IGA expires in a year or two, um, and so it it's might next be wise. March, March of oh, okay. twenty two. Right. So, so it's something that the government yep. needs to needs to be um, uh, dealing with right now, so that we have time. Enter your attendee ID or the oh, uh, may I speak? Or I'm not sure how do we just push our microphone when we want to talk. Sure. Okay, so Lee, 
Um, so this is an issue I follow very closely because uh, I'll tell you what happened in this renegotiation. I'm hearing a, I'm hearing an echo. Are you? Yeah, yeah, okay. good one. Whatever, if everyone could please mute themselves unless they're talking, that will uh, reduce the echoes. So, um, I see two other people with their microphones on, but hopefully there won't be, um, or three. Well, anyway, you know, what happened, Lee, in terms of the, the reality of what happened was during the renegotiation, the county and the town agreed on a lot of things. And some of the things made a lot of sense to both. And that was annexing properties that were already developed. So the area up Caribou Road, that was designated. And initially Hurricane Hill was designated. And those things make sense in the sense of trying to, you know, consolidate uh, the town. And I mean, it made sense to me and it made sense to the county, but the residents in the residential areas refused to be included. I mean, you know, Deb D'Andre and Caribou organized her neighbors. Nobody <clears throat> wanted to be annexed into town. Hurricane, Hurricane Hill got themselves off of this early. So what happened was the only big, there was some, and Karen can correct me, but there's some smaller annexations that would almost certainly have gone through the current IGA. Um, there's somebody who has some property, J, uh, J. Dean, uh, Morris, J. Dean something. She, her property is partly in town, partly in the county there on Eldora Road on the uh, north side. And there was a builder up on the northwest corner who who's building five houses, wanted to be annexed. Those things would, as I understand it, and Karen, correct me, those things, from what I understand the process, would almost certainly have passed through the county. Um, the county process. What happened was it was people who had large pieces of property that wanted to develop them that ended up being very determined to get annexed. So there was the Sundance. And first of all, I should tell you also that Susan, can I can I just make one clarification? Yeah. Because there yeah. there are five small property owners who just are have their own places to develop who wanted to be annexed around the town who weren't those major developers. So I just want to make it clear, there was a, a mix of people who wanted yes. to be able to annex into town. Um, some were north of town, some right. are west of town, some are um, north, northwest of town. So so I just wanted to make that clear. There, there were the big developers, but there were also just some individual yeah. property owners. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that that didn't, I, I tried to clarify that when I said there were a few parcels that made a lot of sense that wanted to be annexed and that would almost certainly, from what I was told, would have had no problem going through the county process. Maybe it incurs a little more time. Well, they didn't, they didn't feel that way, Susan, just so you know that. They felt very strongly that they would rather just work with the town because our code okay. and our, our process is so much simpler. But I'm it just letting you know. Simpler. Yeah. No, I understand that is much simpler. So, well, let me get to the point, Lee, with one of the properties, when you say the county is so tough, there's one property, I won't say anything more, but a property where the developer wants to put 70 units. The original, you know, we had an affordable housing survey back in 2014, and the original survey said there should be no more than 40 units on that piece of property. Mm -hmm. The county said no more than 50. They'd like 50% affordable. The developer said he wanted 70, and the town, in a formal statement, because it's in the record, went to the county. They asked the county to lift all limits on that property. So that means 70 units on a 17 acre piece of property outside the town boundary. And they didn't, you know. So what I'm saying is the county, I thought even the county's, uh, what I'm concerned about is Netherland is much more susceptible to developers than the county is. And this particular property I'm talking about, back in 2016 or 17, the developer put out this booklet, which I have in front of me, which is in the library. And he and his landowner started lobbying to renegotiate the IGA. And here's what he wanted, quote, no context annexation agreement for properties within a five mile radius of the current town of Nederland boundary. Yes, this includes Eldora, call it the greater Nederland area. My concern is that without the county and their commitment to conservation and also the number of experts they have, I mean, even what amazes me is that this, the county was ready to go with 50 units, you know, but they wanted 70. I'm really concerned about 
We have the Board of Trustees turns over regularly. You've got people who are under pressure, as in this case, this developer is determined to get this built. And there's a lot of things, other things that you learn when you're around town that aren't so uh, savory about it. But I'm just concerned. I, I think that the people on the board and the um, planning commission, you know, they're all humans and they're they're susceptible to pressure. And I know there's little things too I've learned, such as this will always be a problem, but there's someone on planning commission who wants nothing done on the north side near his property. You know, I mean, these are human issues. And I feel that, you know, we could modify perhaps, we could we could look for a modified IGA, but I'm concerned also, you know, at um, one of the things that the, the, the town of Netherland put into the, the renegotiation, they took out a popular vote that had been in the previous one. And I went to the last board meeting where they were discussing you know, when, when they were still working on trying to get this renegotiated IGA through, they had a discussion of, well, when should we vote? And they had three options, but they ended up not being able to decide. And it was pretty clear in my mind, they wanted no vote on this particular property because, so I, I'm really concerned that the will of the people is is um, is not gonna be uh, observed and that Boulder County is more committed to environmental conservation than our own you know, Susan, said, do, you, yeah. do you have a, a, a specific statement that you would like to see added to Envision 2030 related to this? Is, is there something you could give us, you know, just a one line that, that says what you're trying to say, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, I don't know what, but, but um, well, that, that's well, kind, of, kind of what we're looking for is, is are, are you suggesting adjustments to what's already been decided or presented? I shouldn't say decided, but um, right. kind of presented by the subgroup. Well, is there something you want changed or added? So, you know, as you, as you probably realized from my, I also went on parts and rec because I'm in a learning process. I didn't start early enough on this, but yes, I intend to go in and I mean, I've been thinking about the same thing in parks and, and recreation where you know, the chairperson was adamant that we could put nothing in there about staying within town boundaries, you know. And so I have been thinking, well, how can we do it in a way that's acceptable to the chairperson? I've been thinking about language and where it would go, but uh, I don't have any yet, but I will. What's the deadline? I, I understand I can go online, right, and make comments, or is it, is that not the best Yeah, way Susan, to it? it's Miranda. Yeah. We'd like that by the 30th of, of April, if you could. Okay. The 30th of April. Okay. And then the other question, I have a question about home rule for Lee. I wasn't connecting it with the IGA, but what I read about home rule, and you can explain more uh, in general, is like we're, we're a statutory municipality, right? That's that would, and this would, this would change our status and we would become, we would create all of our own laws. I mean, maybe we wouldn't actually have to do that, but maybe you or Karen or someone can explain to me what, what kind of changes home rule would bring about. It does mean that we would no longer operate over the uh, under the Colorado Revised Statute, and you're right that we would have to do a whole slew of new um, codes to address the deficit in not operating under the statute anymore. But I'll let Lee go ahead and talk about why they um, chose to make that one of their goals. Okay, well, uh, first of all, I, uh, the committee, as I understood it, we, we didn't say that we were for or against either. Um, we, we, what we stated was that we should look at it um, and try to get consensus. Um, you know, one of the, the, there's advantages to both. Um, you know, we have a year so I think that the government, uh, the current board of trustees should be looking at that. And I think they are. Um, and so we, we didn't really make a recommendation to go one way or the other. We just said that we wanted to look at it. Um, and, and I think that in terms of um, uh, some of the things that we talked about were that being home rule, gave us more say over as a 
as a town over what was right next to us than than being under the the Boulder County IGA, uh, the current Boulder County IGA. Now, I believe me, I, I worked. Uh, I'm the county surveyor, so I really have no problem with Boulder County. Uh, I look at Mud Lake uh, as a great example of uh, Netherland and Boulder County working together to save, you know, 300 plus acres um, on the north side of town and do it in a way that was smart. So I, I don't really have a, a anything, anything uh, against Boulder County, um, but I also think that Netherland should have the ability to do what it needs to do in its best interest without Boulder County being obstructionist. So uh, there may be a middle ground where we renegotiate uh, the uh, IGA to make it so that Netherland has more say, at least for certain parcels that are uh, that are that may be smart to to incorporate into Netherland. But I, I don't really have any. Um, uh, I don't have any axe to grind against Boulder County. I just it's one of those things that the goal is to is to see what works best for Netherland, and and that was why we put it in there. I, I would just say, yeah, the IGA it's um, intergovernmental, so it is a mutual. It is a mutual agreement, and I know when we had one of our the meetings on this with the county, Dale Case um, introduced it by saying in 2002, when Netherland and the county signed this, they both agreed on the future of Netherland. Netherland also didn't want to develop outside its boundaries, and Dale Case said, but Netherland has changed its its mind. So what you're talking about and what's difficult here is what is Netherland? Who is Netherland? Is it the town officials? Is it... And one of my concerns, if you look at the other cities and towns that dropped their IGAs with the county, that's Lafayette, that's Erie, I think that's Louisville, the, the development has gone crazy because that's the natural, when you say it's in the interest of Netherland, well, what seems to be in the interest of the people who are in government in any city is, you know, getting the money to run the town. And, and so they tend to make, and plus they're often friends with the people or they, so anyway, so I just, can I just make a couple statements about that? Because while there are, I would say, you know, and I worked with the board during this time and the planning commission, I would say there was about a third on both boards who felt that we should keep the IGA just as it is and extended about a third who thought we should let it lapse and, and let the town figure it out and that there there's smart enough people here who can figure it out. And then about a third who felt like we should do what Lyons did which is renegotiate the IGA, work with the county, figure out what areas both already agree should be um, you know, ready for annexation, and then still have that whole rural protected area as well. So I just want to make it clear, the government did not come out as a, as, as a unified voice at all. And if you attended all of the forums that we had and all the public meetings we had, had for this, there was people across the board, both elected, appointed, and people from the community. So I just want to make that clear. I mean, Susan, I, I'm hearing what you're saying, and you certainly represent, um, you know, a big voice in the community of, for people who are very concerned about potential for wildfires and wildlife migration and protecting the environment and making sure we're not putting too much wear and tear in our infrastructure and all those kinds of things. I just want to see in my experience, and there were hundreds of people, and I have all the notes from those meetings, hundreds and hundreds of people who came to the meeting, weighed in online. They are, there, there is a, a, a wide spectrum of how people showed up in this conversation, including the elected officials. I also just want to say one other thing in that is that I want to make sure that we give time for Vicki Poe to weigh in since she's in this too, to see if she has any um, things she wanted to add or questions. So maybe if we could wrap up, you know, um, the IGA question in maybe the next five minutes and then give her an opportunity to weigh in too, that would be great. I'll just say I did go to the two large meetings, but um, perhaps if the town had contacted any of the people whose land was included in this, we would feel a little bit differently, but you know, 
the town, it was actually the county that two, two years after, more than two years after town officials started talking to the county about designating certain areas as prime for development, that did, did people get notified by the county that their properties were being considered in this way? And, and I, per, and so just, you know, just to give my, we, we have this 10 acre mining claim. And the only reason it continues to be a wildlife corridor is because we're under county rules. We have one house per, you know, you can't have more than one house per 35 acres. And that has permitted the continuation. So when I looked at the paperwork that showed that I was in an area all along the Southern border, all of that property, this ended up being the prime area for development because so many people pulled off. And I just thought that was wrongheaded. And it came about in part because of, you know, areas that made more sense pulling out as, as a group. But, um, it, you know, one of the standards that you have to meet for the state is that the area is urban or will soon be urban. And I found it really deeply distressing that an area, so forested area surrounded by national forest, that this was the town's, this was the town's perspective that this is an area prime for development. And I did, and I will note again that the 23 acres on the north of town, one lot that was considered that is part of the Walton purchase and they own land all up from there north once they get that annexed in, they can continue developing there. And then on the south side, you know, you know that when it was someone where the owner very much wanted to develop. And I, I felt it was being driven more by developers than by, in the end, I don't think it started that way, but. And, and I have to say, I, I don't think the town communicates well. I, I still bear a feeling of um, unhappiness that I happened to learn early because I knew someone associated with the county who said, hey, did you know that your property is in this air zone that the town is working with the county to designate as the prime, a prime area for the town to direct annex and direct its development? I said, no, I didn't know that. And most people didn't find out until the county told them in May, 2019. So. Um, so I have a lot of problems with the town's ability to communicate and the town's ability to listen. And, and I went to a lot of the meetings too, and I heard a lot of people who weren't happy. So, you know, I hear, but I appreciate your description of you were in on a lot more than I was your description of seeing a third and a third and a third. And I certainly think renegotiating, I don't want to see it dropped altogether, but I certainly think it could be renegotiated to be more, to be easier for certain kinds of parcels to be. Um, and, and just one last thing we can go on is dropping the vote. It just helped to communicate to the public that really what they're trying to do is find a way to annex some properties that the main part of the community would not would not agree with. And they wanted to eliminate the possibility of a vote that would. So it all it leads to lack of trust and uh, so there. So I'm done. That's done. That's my IJ and the home rule thing. Uh, I think it's worth uh, if it's going to be put in there, then probably some more specifics should be put in. I, I already, I have to tell you, I already am always amazed at every board of trustees meeting at the variety and the complexity of issues that these people have to vote on. And in particular, when they first start, and um, I just think that our town's got a pretty heavy load and it seems like home rule might be stretching above our capacity. But anyway, that, I, I'm done. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Susan. Vicki, is there anything that you wanted to talk about? Related um, to municipal governments or the economy? No, there, there wasn't anything specific. Like I said, uh, Ron had left me a voicemail a couple of weeks ago that there was going to be a Wednesday meeting. <laughs> and at the time, I couldn't find last Wednesday's meeting, so I signed up for this Wednesday's meeting. And I figured I should probably attend this week's meeting anyway. So um, just to keep keep a pulse on what's going on. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure that if there was something, you know, that you had that it was shared. And I don't know, Scott or Ron or Don, if you want to weigh in as well on the conversation having to do with home rule versus statutory or the IGA, uh, you know, the big IGA uh, having to do with annexation. I will chime in on this. I know that IGAs are not always in place to promote development. So the IGA that used to exist between Erie Lafayette and Louisville actually prevented development in the town of Erie and it kept things a little bit more, uh, well, it kept things as they were for a long time. And so there's no reason why we can't redefine and renegotiate an IGA to work 
in a manner that we want it to work instead of just figuring that it's always going to promote development. We don't, we don't have to be subject to what somebody else wants to do all the time. So let's look at the IGA in greater detail and figure out, you know, how does it work best for the town of Nederland? I mean, it's, it needs to be a win-win for us and the county. Otherwise, it's no deal, right? We're not going to get something passed unless it's a win-win. We need to look at it. And that's what we currently have, Scott. We have an extremely restrictive one, which means yeah. that there's no annexation that goes on in the town um, without also going through the Boulder County process. And um, I know Erie was probably the most recent community that let go of that IGA yeah. and, and yeah. just a few years ago. And you and of course we can all see what what's happened in Erie. That's right. And it hasn't been, I mean it's Guys, what we have here, as far as the land and the area we live, I mean, it's there's only one of this, right? And we live here, and so there's no reason why we can't we can't work with the county to get something that's a win for us as well as a win for the county. That's all I'll say at this point on it. Thanks. Mitchell, this is Ron Mitchell. Well, uh, I didn't realize Ms. Poe was on the uh, meeting. Uh, my intention was for her to uh, weigh in at the DDA meeting, uh, which was last Wednesday. Uh, this is a different meeting, but I'm glad she's here. Uh, thank, that's all. Thanks, Ron. Don, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, so I was just going to say I agree with what Scott said, and I do understand this IGA is very restrictive, and we do want to preserve what we have, but there is, I believe, I'm going to weigh in on the fact of it needs to be renegotiated, not just renewed or dropped to home rule, because um, there are some definite advantages. I just think it needs to be renegotiated right now it, it favors the county and i would like to see a, a better balanced iga between netherland and the county um that again we have the conflicting goals between um affordable housing environmental preservation um you can be sustainable and do a very limited annexation i believe and still preserve what we got. So I, yeah, renegotiate is my two cents. Thank you. See if you'd want to make any comments about um, the economic development portion. So we've been talking about the municipal government. And um, what 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 the main thoughts were discussions in your group on um, what you put into the and I guess Ron as well would be I think you both were right in the committee that worked on this. So I mean I I can read it, but it's always helpful to me to hear an individual explain what kind of thoughts went into developing the statement. Uh, well, the, go ahead, Lee. Go ahead, Ron. That's that's fine. All right, thank you. Um, I am a guy who is goal oriented to specific goals, and so both Lee and I had proposed some specific goals, and uh, they've morphed into generalizations. And I found last night that generalizations are very easily turned into political weapons. Goals that give you a specific thing to do. Uh, I think are better, but uh, the emphasis and the uh, uh, thrust of this is to come up with generalizations, and um, I just don't think uh, you'll end up with very much advancement for things that are wanted uh, using that technique. That's all. Thank you. I, I can chime in on that too. I I, I tend to agree with Ron. Um, uh, I would like to see more specifics. Uh, I've been told by other committee members, uh, other other members of the Envision 2030 team, the, the whole team, 
that that's not the purpose of the of the of the goal part of the um, of the economic yet uh, the, the economic goals that we need to be more general. Um, my concern um, and and um, is that okay? So uh, the northern edge of town. Uh, we 20 years ago, we, we were ready and we, we saved mud Lake. Um, and it, it happened fast. Um, the woman who owned it, um, you know, wanted to sell originally, there was going to be seven homes along, uh, next to mud Lake and, uh, the town and the, um, Boulder County came together to save that area. Uh, and it happened fast. Um, and then about 10 years ago or 12 years ago, the same thing kind of happened on the south side of town where Mary Wingate um, had a bunch of land on the hill that's kind of behind um, uh, State Highway uh, 72 uh, in between Peak View and downtown that, uh, you know, was ripe for being developed. Um, and um, and the town and Mary came to an agreement whereby, um, you know, that area was put into a conservation easement. So when you're downtown now, you look at that hill and there, and it can't really change. And so what I see now is that we have a couple of parcels, two or three main parcels downtown that we really need to be ready for. And um, my thought was to try to put specifics into the um, into the envi envision specifics. And so we started talking about, well, what do the citizens want? Do we want First Street to be a walking mall or do we want First Street to still have traffic on it? And uh, what 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 about the idea of a town square? Do we want a town square on the south half of the, of the visitors parking lot, visitor center parking lot? I mean, I wanted specifics in there so that we could envision something specific. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then in addition, I, I came up with an idea that I think might actually work where, uh, where we do get the citizens involved, where we have, uh, so for example, uh, downtown right now on first street is, is pretty clogged with, with traffic. It's not wide enough for traffic and parking and deliveries. Um, you know, and, and that's a problem. And so if we had, um, let, let's say we put, um, a, uh, a, a little map that shows, uh, the downtown area currently, and then shows how we could pull buildings off the North property line. If that, if that area is developed to allow for better parking and better, um, uh, more parking and, and. The, uh, and more and better walkways, or do we want it to be some sort of a walking mall? And if we put that, uh, put those three choices in public places like the, the town hall, um, the library or the post office, and then got people to weigh in, the town to weigh in, uh, the citizens of the town to weigh in on uh, what they like, we, we could have some sort of direction for when, uh, when and if uh, these uh, pieces, especially the downtown pieces, um, go through some sort of development, we would have a, an idea from the town as to what they want the town board to negotiate with the private landowners in those areas. Um, and so I, I'm really concerned about these areas downtown. I, I think we've solved the north area for now. We've solved the south side of town, at least the, the main part of the south side of town, there's others that we need to look at. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the downtown. Well, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know if this is the place to discuss it, but I know Steve and I would, would go to the library and Steve in particular loved to look through the brochure that Ron Mitchell's company had designed for downtown. But I've never understood, um, never understood why that sort of some sort of idea since that was in the comprehensive plan that we should redevelop the central business district. I mean, I agree with you that it sounds good. The idea if you have workforce housing there, you walk to work, you, so, um, 
I mean, I'd be curious to hear what, what the obstacles are. Why why we haven't been able to? Is it just too many different interests conflicting in the downtown area that we can't we can't make that a reality of what was put into that 2013 comp plan? Or Ron, do you want to address that? I'd love to, and I could go on and on about it. Well, first off, you've got a lot of conflicting ordinances and laws that make it really impractical to do anything. Uh, we need parking downtown. Part of that proposal was to have two levels of underground parking, one for the uh, uh, public and one for the hotel that would go in there, and it would be 300 cars. We barely have 150 cars in the entire area there right now. Uh, and one of the proposals was to pull the property lines, pull the, the fronts of the buildings back to the north, take them from where they are now and go north 25 feet, so that you have much greater parking space, pedestrian uh, 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 amenities, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, it just got uh, uh, thrown on. Well, it, <laughs> I received enough negative feedback that I decided just to wait until somebody really wants to talk about it and be specific and say, okay, let's make it uh, a deal. And let's say, okay, if you pull the... Uh, the uh, property line back 25 feet and give the town the property so they can put their streets there and their utilities there and really make uh, First Street wider and better and more beautiful, then give the developer 15 more feet of height so we can put two levels of parking there. Because if you have two levels of parking, you must have three levels of housing and retail to support it where it doesn't work financially. So that's part of the problem. The, is the height limit. So Lee and I had talked about it. He said, okay, how about a 50-foot height limit so we can at least have slanted roofs, peaked roofs, instead of flat roofs, which always leak. So, and I could just go on and on, but that could give you a, a bit of the flavor of why it hasn't been done. I'd love to do it, but there has to be a cooperative, uh, collaborative element. And I really tried. I did a lot of charrettes. I set it out to the public that those views have been in the library now four years. So give me the opportunity and I'll do it. But I want to put there what the town wants, but it has to be economically viable. So if you want two levels of parking and, and the south side of the street to survive, then you got to have two levels of parking. If you have two levels of parking, you got to have three levels of commercial activity to support that parking. Parking spaces underground cost anywhere from $40,000 to $50,000 a piece in our environment. So that's a bit more than downtown Boulder, but you've got to haul all that concrete up from Boulder. So does that give you kind of a flavor of where things are at? Yes, it does. I wonder if Karen, as town administrator for the past years, has any uh, any comment on the town. Well, I have... Because I wondered why the town, if they didn't like it, didn't maybe make suggestions on well, changes. Or, yeah, yeah, no, what happened is the last time that Ron brought it before the Board of Trustees was as a conceptual plan. And that was in January, was it 2018 or 2019, Ron? Anyways, he, he um, the, the town actually, and not just the elected officials, but even the, uh, the public, the public comments and everything were very much in support. He got super great feedback. I know there was a list of things that he was asked to kind of look at when he would come back with his preliminary plans. But then for a variety of reasons on Ron's side, I know um, some issues that came up for him, he has not reapplied. So, so he actually was given the go ahead and actually a lot of really good positive feedback. Ron, weren't you kind of surprised? How? Because I remember you even, uh, you hired, I think, one of our, our our officers to be there because you were concerned there was going to be so much negative backlash. But in the end, it was kind of a little love fest. Everybody was saying positive things about all the time you put into your analysis and how you align things with the comprehensive plan. And that, you know, people wanted to see what you were going to bring back, but then I'll let you speak to the reasons why you were held up in bringing anything back. I just did. Uh, for, to get 
what was wanted and what would be economically viable wouldn't fit in with the zoning that we have today. And uh, so in terms of, there's a lot of things. Uh, we have a design code, and that design code says anything new has to look like everything that exists right now. No three-story building is going to look like one-story building surrounding it. So, and, and putting a pencil to it and looking at what everybody thought could be done just wasn't economically going to work. We need 15 more feet of height to make it work to get the parking that is needed for both sides of the street. And uh, that's part of the plan, not just to create a development that serves itself, but a development that serves the whole area. And that means nobody, people on the south side have a real problem. Their front of their buildings are actually in the street and they don't have any parking because it's their, the backs of their buildings are on the creek. So it, it makes sense <coughs> to plan for everybody, not just the property that I own. And that wasn't possible under the restrictions that were there. I went over and over and over, and it just couldn't be done. I need an increase of 15 feet in height to do it. And that was one of the specific things that Lee had put into the uh, goals, and it morphed out to a general statement. And I just don't think if we don't do that, it won't happen. And you could instead talk about height uh, bonuses, you know, and density bonuses for creating affordable spaces, whether they're, you know, commercial spaces that are affordable or um, housing that's affordable. The other thing is, Ron, um, and just to answer Susan's question more, Ron and his folks met with the town staff and we went through a whole list of all, you know, his next steps to make things go forward, you know, so he could like rezone one property that he could then turn into workforce housing um, and so on and so forth. So he, he knows the plan um, to, to get things moving forward. But as he said, you know, if he, he can't figure it out financially to meet his big vision, that's that's kind of the big holdup, correct, Ron? Well, I'll jump in for Ron. I think that's true. Uh, what, what you just said is true. Um, you know, here's the thing. Um, uh, Ron's Ron's plan is is the entire downtown, and and so uh, he's right. The code. This is why we put into our economic and governmental uh, goals, uh, looking at the codes, and also looking at zoning. Right, and I could speak uh, to that just just briefly that. Part of the reasons why there's some restrictions in the code, like only so many applications at one time and that sort of thing, is because of our limited resources. You know, we don't have a full planning department. We we have vendors we work with like SafeBuilt who actually act as our building inspectors. You know, we don't have the kind of bandwidth that like the city of Boulder or Boulder County does. So for a project like Ron's, um, for us as a staff to process it, and then I think even the community to process it, you have to kind of do it in pieces. But that doesn't really resonate with what Ron's going for, which I totally understand. But I absolutely see where there is a problem. Um, and so we'd have to really look at, relook at how we approach community development. Um, which, like you've said, Lee, through through our code and through our zoning and that type of thing. And and I'd like to add that what what we also talked about economically and governmentally was the uh, the utilities that are uh, you know we have utilities that are aging in these streets. Um, so in First Street, there's aging utilities. Second Street, there's aging utilities. In Schneider Street and in Bridge Street, aging utilities. So it makes sense to also, if we're going to talk about 
um, redevelopment, especially in the downtown area, we should also be cognizant that when you redevelop something on a scale like this, you're going to need better utilities. And it makes sense to, if you've got the equipment out there building, digging a hole, to fix the utilities that are in the streets that are adjacent to where the work is being done. That's one and of that's the other what goals. We're doing. And that, Could some people turn off their microphones? Sorry, I'm just having a lot of static. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about that with what Lee just said is um, that's certainly what we've got an eye on. So for the transportation improvement project, for instance, um, Chris Pelletier had the foresight to see that it was a great opportunity if we're going to be tearing up streets and tearing up sidewalks to get Excel to bury their their um, their uh, their services, you know, uh, on that stretch from the uh, RTD to the visitor center. So we really do have that in mind. That makes perfect sense, Lee. But if you're gonna go ahead and dig up stuff, let's replace the aging infrastructure, let's bury our power lines, you know, let's improve the aesthetics as well as the, the infrastructure in our town. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. I, I was just gonna ask about town square. That can come later. You mentioned a town square and I wondered what the was on where that would be, but I'll put that aside and, and let Scott speak. Thanks, Susan. You know what? Can everybody hear me okay? I think I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, yes. So my background is in financial analysis and economics, and as circumstance would have it, I also have worked on projects that have to do with development within the hospitality industry outside of Netherlands. And I would say I'm probably going to be the person on this group who is going to be a pain from time to time, because I'm going to urge caution and restraint with with some of the plans that are going to come forward. And I definitely want to urge restraint when it comes to building things upward. Now, obviously, that's the only place we have to go really is upward. But, you know, when people talk about economic development, I'm going to tell you that until we had a canyon project two years ago and then COVID over the last 15 months, I would love to see some numbers of how the businesses in town really have been doing for a number of years, because this is, I've done this all my adult life for companies is look at these numbers and do projections and look at profitability and look at development as it relates to those numbers. And I have to tell you, I don't believe, I am not convinced that the only solution for the town of Netherlands to be a happy group of people is to build up and go as big as possible. And I have seen countless instances in my career and all around me where people take a good thing and they want to build two, three, four, five X of it because they think that's two, three, four, five times better and they ruin it. Right. And so I'm not saying that anything that's being talked about right here is wrong. All I'm saying is before we all go thumbs up, let's do it. I I would like to see some numbers around. Way, the way that businesses have been performing and surviving and thriving in Netherlands over the past several years before we had, like I say, Canyon project over the last two years and COVID over the last year. Because I don't think we have to go as big as possible to be successful. There's a lot of demand out there for what Netherlands is. We have a lot of visitors. I think everybody agrees that you know our strength, our economic engine is tourism. I don't necessarily believe that going as big as we possibly can is going to be a solution or a formula for happiness or a great community. So I'm going to I'm going to challenge this group when I hear ideas being pushed forward without substance or with it, without seeing what's behind it. And I appreciate you hearing me out on that. Thanks. Scott, um, one thing I can tell you as an indicator of the the um, the economic vitality of the town or how the businesses are doing is that we've we've kept a pretty stable number of businesses even throughout the um, even throughout the pandemic, and our sales tax revenue has increased over the last ten years, averaging nine percent a year. 
So that I know it doesn't give a full picture, but it just answers a little bit of the question that you had. So, Karen, when you say that, you're not talking about the rates have increased 9%. You're saying the absolute number has increased 9%, which tells us that generally, probably, overall revenue has increased somewhere in the neighborhood of 9%. Exactly. Thank you. That helps. That's a starter. Thank you. I guess I, I'd like to chime in. I'd like to chime in on on that. I, I think that um, no one is suggesting, uh, uh, at least in the economic group that I'm in, that we should just go as big as possible. But I am concerned that with with some of these parcels that uh, that we look at the whole the whole. Uh, especially in the downtown area that we look at the whole downtown uh, um, as as one kind of uh, one big big piece of of what's going to happen and my concern is is that if we start dividing it up that uh, and and not look at it wholly uh, that we're going to end up with uh, people coming in in the future and possibly with with a lot more cash and possibly just being able to run over the town um, with cash and um, and do what they want where we're not in where the town doesn't have a say. And I would rather the town be in a position, I would rather be proactive and work with the landowners that we have right now in trying to create a vision um, that is more that is better for the whole that that gets us something that's better than just doing it piecemeal um and Lee, so yeah and i i am absolutely in agreement with you 100 percent. the last thing we want is for people to say you know what i'm done doing this i'm going to sell off my piece and whoever comes in and buys it behind me whoever gives me the highest bid for this this parcel they can do whatever they want and that we don't have a holistic approach. I agree with you 100%. I want to make sure that that the people who are interested in this and the people who who are concerned about it we have a say and that that holistic approach goes in a direction that we all feel good about. I mean, we're as invested in here as anybody. And I and I said this recently when another development was being planned just down the street from me is the people who already live here, we're as invested as it can be, right? So we care. And I, and I really think that you and I are saying the same thing. Now, the other thing I'd like to say is that uh, we are a town. So whenever, whenever my, my idea all along for Netherland and whenever I think of planning at all in terms of, of um, from a survey, I'm a surveyor, so I think from a survey standpoint, I think of mapping number one. Um, whenever you put something in an area, like for example, when we put the town shop near the county shop, that's a like use. And so the downtown area, if we're gonna have bigger buildings, if bigger buildings are what allows us to save um, a, a more vital area near town for either my uh, uh, wildlife migration or whatever it is, then I, I there's always a trade-off. Uh, but I'm I'm concerned. I, I I like a like use. So, in a downtown area, it makes sense to have more density uh, than in an area at the edge of town. And so that's the other thing. Uh, um, uh, to be economically viable, um, when we're looking at the big picture. Sometimes we have to think in terms of, well, if we're going to do the whole thing at once, we have to think about the economics of it also and whether or not it's serving a bunch of different needs like parking, low income housing, et cetera. And when we do that, we save another area from being um, from being used in the wrong, I'm not gonna say the wrong way, but in a way that is not a like use uh, for that area, so. 
let's talk about what um, economically viable means because that, that's a phrase that gets thrown around every hour of the day, every time you turn on a TV or radio or sit down with somebody. Economically viable is seen in different ways by different people. And I will tell you that I think we have made a mistake of believing it means infinite growth. And I want to I want to caution anybody in town from believing that that growing forever and ever and ever is what economically viable should mean, and that should be our goal. Well, I'm there. I mean, um, I, I don't think we. There's no way we can do. We can grow uh, <laughs> very much. I mean, we're limited by. <laughs> We're completely limited by national forest all around us and Boulder County open space. I mean, there's very little, there's very little directions we can go. So, right. I mean, uh, uh, so, I mean, in that regard, I, uh, you know, I, 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 during, during the time I've been on this committee, I, I've heard from some people that don't want anything to change. And, and that is just unrealistic. Yeah. Um, completely uh, so i mean um economically viable to me means that the businesses are not changing that, that we're not changing again and again and again and, and new places constantly coming in and and we have had a fairly stable for the most part i mean fairly stable uh, shops in, in town i mean I guess the mine shafts turned over a few times. I don't think that was that was that was more due to personal personal issues with whoever was running it. Um, but I don't know. You know, you look at you look at the village shopping center where Tebow owns the the shopping center there. It seems like um, there's there's places going in and out of business constantly there. So, uh, and, and I've heard a lot of people. Uh, even on the on this committee say that nothing they don't want anything to change and they want Netherland to to uh, be completely the, that the people that live here the 700 households that live in Netherland and the four or five thousand people that live in the area to be the sole engine of of uh, the economics for the town and I, I think that's kind of unrealistic I uh, you know whether or not we like it or not there's a certain amount of traffic that comes through town um for, to, for the ski resort for the for one of the 50 best drives in america i mean they're coming through the town and so we have to look at everything uh everything is connected to that so when the carousel of happiness is an example was put there uh 10 or 12 or whenever it was put there in the 2000s you know that that got people to stop and spend a little bit of money in town and that's good for our that's good for the economic engine of the town and so um we we have to look at uh walkability we have to look at um you know parking ability we're, we're doing something along big springs right now we have to look at you know how, how do we get people out of their cars for a half hour some of the people not all of them we, there's nowhere we could put them but some of the people out of their cars to stop and spend you know 15 bucks uh, at the bookstore getting an ice cream lee, lee that seems like a good segue to go to susan wagner's question about um having like a town center do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah um so uh, about i don't know five or six years ago or maybe longer uh uh members of of the town staff and and also i think it might have been the dta at the time they they asked uh we, we started this idea of a town square and uh you know you see them a lot like in in if you go to mexico or even down in downtown boulder you've got in front of the courthouse you've got a, a square there um so we we Came up, uh, what I did was I created a map that shows the visitor center parking lot. And there's a couple of different ways that that could be modified into a town square. Now, you know, ideally we would just turn the whole thing into a town square. Uh, so all the way from the north, north side of the visitor center, all the way to the creek. Um, but you lose uh, parking 
when you do that. So that ties into what Ron's saying. You know, if we if if the downtown area is developed and we have extra, we have two levels of parking that would mitigate uh, some of the parking that we're losing. Another idea would be half the the southern half of the uh, visitor center being turned into a town square, you know, terracing down to the creek, possibly even having a walkway under the highway attached to the side of the abutment of the creek uh, so that people could walk under the highway. Um, and then that also ties into the idea that Chris Larson had at one of the meetings where he said, well, instead of moving the buildings back, like Ron's original idea was, we we leave the buildings where they are right up on the line um, and turn the whole first street from between Bridge Street and Schneider Street into a walking mall. Um, you know, so, so uh, those are a couple of ideas that we batted around and, um, you know, certainly I have the map that shows that, but again, it ties into parking. When, whenever you lose parking spaces, you have to make them up somewhere. And, and that also ties into the zoning where across from uh, Schneider's garage, currently there's a parking area there that is only allowed 19 uh, space for 19 cars in the current zoning. So these are these things are all tied together. I have a question about that. I would like um, to make a comment, I would like, if I may, and I will make it brief. But I get really concerned when I, as the owner of a piece of property, and everyone knows I own it, people say, well, the developers don't care. And I personally have been around town for 65 years, and I do care. And I'm not taking offense as to what the gentleman said, but often that seems to imply that I don't. And I want to make it clear that I do. Thank you. I, I agree with that, Ron. And um, I'm not sure Scott was where when he said, I think, Scott, your perception maybe wasn't quite on point so much no. about the development. Because it's not to make it really no. big, it's to keep it. That's, I just want to say, well, let me finish and then you can. But my, the reason why I like the idea, and it's in our comprehensive plan that we develop in the central business district, it's a sustainable route. It, it, it allows people to use public transportation, to walk. And as long as that central area stays as it is and is not used for the purposes that would concentrate activity there and make it more sustainable, well, then people like them, that, that's easier. Then that's one reason why there's a push for annexation, I think, because it's easier to let someone get annexed in and develop their thing than it is to work out a problem like our central business district. And I would like to know if there isn't some source of government if we can't get some of Biden's money to say we want a sustainable town and our plan and let's get money and also couldn't we tie ourselves more to the county so that Karen I really am saying because I see it over and over that we, we don't experts in various departments and can spend a lot of time working on this stuff and so our hands our hands are so tied that it's, it's kind of frustrating that's my comment I want to address what just got said, Ron. If I said anything implied that I thought you didn't care, that was either a mistake in my the way I express it or in the way it came across, and never ever meant to imply that at all. Thank you. So I hear a silence. I'd like to mention something that I think is worth talking about. You know, when we talk about developing Netherland, we've got, um, I have to say something that hasn't been talked about yet, but Lee, you and I have talked about it. It costs money, obviously, on behalf of the town to develop itself. It's not just money that's put up by people who are investing and in owning properties, but the town has to put a lot of effort and a lot of resources into it as well. And I think we have got, um, We've got some really, really valuable property right down by the reservoir. And every time I go to the post office and I look over at, um, you know, petroleum tanks 
sitting there, it breaks my heart that the most, one of the most scenic places in this entire valley is being used as a chain link fence storage facility for petroleum tanks. And I think that it, it's worth thinking about, we're not gonna work it all out here, obviously, but it's worth thinking about for the town to, to use some of our resources and what we're gonna put into this overall vision to maybe incent the people who, who own and manage that business to relocate it to an area that's more suitable. That is probably some of the best real estate in town that could be developed to run the economic engine. And I think it doesn't have to be necessarily built massively. The, the bigger and the taller it is in a spot like that, the less view everybody has, but there's that area. And then obviously there's the old black forest, which is a, a pretty nice hunk of land right there. Whatever it takes to give us access to develop that area, I think those are two places right in town, right in front of us, under our noses, that we haven't talked about, but I hope that they're on a list, a high on a list of priorities God, for areas you, to attack. Would you like to know a little bit about like the propane property, for instance? Because well, because the town has been negotiating with those owners for years and they do not want to sell it. And um, I actually got pretty far with the family trust at one point about two years ago. I actually yep. thought we might get somewhere. And then um, someone died. The trust um, uh, disintegrated. I'm not using the right word. Um, and now only one family member owns it and she won't even return our calls. So I just wanted to know, and Black Forest kind of has a similar story. Of course, Tivo yep. owns it. We all know that, you know, um, but it's not like the town hasn't been aware of these um, and isn't, hasn't been in negotiations, but um, I will, I will tell you those the people that own that propane um, land do not want to give it up. They signed a five-year lease with the propane company, I think two years ago, maybe two and a half. Um, so the hope is that maybe, you know, we can start negotiating again and see if we yep. can get anywhere with them. But it's hard when it's, it's owned by, you know, it's private property. We, you know, I'm, you know. Yeah. And, and you know what, I, I've heard that before and I respect that and I know that's a problem. Um, I don't know how we go about how we go about readdressing that. There's got to be some way that we create a win-win with both those parties, Tebow and the propane people. I'm not proposing that there's an easy solution, but I, I would say we, we can't give up on them. They're too valuable to the town. And I, I agree with that. that. I totally I think, agree. With that. I think we're all in agreement. We, we want it. We just got to find a way to do it, right? Yeah, uh, I would like to add this. So the we, if we could help with the problem, uh, the the owner and the propane company are fairly close, and uh, so if we were to find a location and approve it for the propane company to move. They would do that, but their fear is that if the property is sold and they're told to leave, there's no place for them to go. So don't get the cart before the horse. Uh, hey. The property will never be available unless there's an absolutely a guaranteed place for the propane company to move to. So right. that, that should, everybody should know that. Thank and you. you know what, Ron, this is... Lee and I were talking about this uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago. Tom was in the conversation as well. And we know that there are areas, you know, within a mile of town where a propane chain link fence with propane tanks and a, and a yard would be far more suitable than it is where it is right now, you know? So I agree with well, you. We have, to give, we have to give them a reason and a place, both. That's right. That's yep. right. I'm They're with you. We're never going to get it until we solve the, the new location for the propane company. I, I can pretty much guarantee you that. Agreed, 100. percent We can do that. We can't. We we have to do that. And I, I I agree with you in terms of concept of the area. 
and uh, others do too. I mean, we just put a uh, the DDA just paid for a little electric uh, facility to put down put down there, kind of a seed to try and get events to use the area and uh, and encourage the uh, uh, park concept and aspect of the area down there. So there's lots of people interested in it. They just have to understand what the sequence of events has to be for it to be a reality. Agreed. And so when I talk about, you know, how we use our resources as a town, one of them would have to be incent those propane people. And, and part of that incentive is going to be, look, here's a location. It's perfect for you. It's easy access. It's appropriate. I agree. We have right. to and, do that. Gonna, and, and, and then we have then you're a finance guy, you know, full well, they don't want to pay any more rent than they're paying. So somehow money has to come to buy yep. that land to where the, uh, and then the lady isn't going to let go of the land if the propane leaves cheap. She knows the town wants it. Well, I tell you what, so, that piece of land right there, you cannot find, <laughs> you cannot find a piece of land with more potential in this town than that has um with all due respect to everything that's already in operation in town i mean that is the most underutilized well located hunk of land that we have and so i think we need to be as motivated as we can possibly be to make something happen for the town well, i'm with that's you there but I, I see the sequence just as i described it you got to get you got to have something that the propane company will First, they'll accept, and you got to finance it, and then you got to convince the lady to let us have it at a reasonable price. Yep. That's a big, tall order. But I, if I'm, we if we if we don't address that tall order now, we'll be having this conversation for the rest of our lives. Well, that conversation's been going on for about forty years that I've been around town. Yep. So, I, and I'd love to see somebody take the bull by the horns and really see where we can find a location to move the uh, the propane tanks. And one of the things they tell me is they'd like to be in a canyon somewhere that has tight walls, that if one tank were to blow up, that nothing would get damaged uh, laterally, that the explosion would go straight up. So interestingly enough, that's, they'd that's something they'd like, whether there's canyon, a, a ravine or a canyon or somewhere where they had a flat spot uh, comparable to what they've got now, but protected from ex an explosion. And that's one of the concerns. The risk of explosion of those tanks is very, very low, though. But they're, they're, it isn't zero. So I'm, I'm all for Hey, folks, we've, we've got there. about 10 minutes left. I'm going to check in with you, Vicki, just one more time and see if there's anything you want to add to the conversation. I'm good to go for today. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate your being in on this conversation. It's, it's nice to see a new name. Don, was there anything that you would like to contribute? I'm sorry. No, I'm good. I've got some thoughts. I'm holding the Okay, sounds good. Any last closing thoughts as we wrap this up, folks? I think the only thing we haven't talked about tonight that um, uh, didn't make it into the uh, uh, economic uh, um, a part of this is um, something that's been uh, I, I guess batted around for at least 20 years and possibly longer than that is the possibility of putting in a second bridge across the creek. Um, and, and um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with different people uh, about that for and against, but um, Anyway, that's something else. Yeah, and then, um, in, tw in 2017 was the last time that the staff actually brought it to the Board of Trustees and um, Chris Pelletier had gotten some numbers where we could have used our own property over connecting um, across the creek uh, 
uh, from Chapita Park over to the other side, uh, just use, utilizing our property, but making it really set for pedestrians and strollers and things like that, but that could be used in an emergency situation. And back then, I think the cost was around a half a million, 600,000, something like that. So it's sure to be a lot more at this point, but if it was the town trying to do it using our own property, it would probably be something along that line where it's town property, it's a bridge that is able to take, um, take vehicles, but only used for vehicles in emergency. And otherwise it's really, um, you know, a pedestrian kind of uh, use. So that, that's the only thing the town itself has been able to sort of come up with on our own. We are aware, you know, that Ron Mitchell's plans include the potential for a bridge. We also know, you know, Russ Meyerson's property has an existing bridge there now, um, but that's also not a great location when you talk about trying to squirrel uh, vehicles during, um, during an emergency. So it has been talked about as recently as like six months ago. But I think that the problem is, unless it's the town's property, we can't dictate uh, what a private property owner is gonna do, you know? Um, so that's sort of been the holdup. And I know with Ron's project being held up, um, that's also held up the potential for having a bridge you know, uh, abutting his property. We also, th there is a potential for some funding though for a second bridge that could be coming through in the next year. So um, it would be nice to start this conversation up again. And, um, you know, not sure what you're thinking, Lee, about what the answer is. Well, my, my thoughts are, are well known in the committee um, I, I think that there's a perfect spot for it. I think uh, Ron, uh, Ron's uh, property on the south side of First Street, which is currently a parking lot uh, that is not really a parking lot because it's zoned wrong, um, allows, uh, allows it, if the town were to approach the private landowner um, and especially if it's all done comprehensively, uh, then that is the spot that makes most most sense and doesn't hurt Chapita Park for a full bridge across uh, the creek that goes between Schneider and Conger. Um, and uh, so I, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, citizens for and against that. Um, you know, my, my thoughts on it are, are that it is smart, uh, especially for, uh, the residents that live here. It helps the residents that lives here because most of the people that are using the highway are going to stay on the highway. Um, and it does make the town safer if there, if something happens uh, on the current bridge where it's where you can't, where there's an accident or something that you can't, that stops traffic on that bridge, it becomes a safety issue. Um, and um, if, you know, if you live on the south side of town and you need medical care and there's an accident on the, on the bridge and you can't get through, or if right. there's an event going, event going right. on, it's a safety issue. Yeah, I think everybody knows the need. And I know it's been talked about for, you know, 20 years or whatever, it really comes down to um, where is it going to take place? And if it is a private property owner, how are we going to make that work? So, you know, that's really, the, that, those are really the obstacles. So, so this is another case for, for uh, having the town enter it. The, the this is another case where private landowners and the town need to work together uh, because as a surveyor, I, you know, private property is private property. Um, but, but there can be 
uh, discussions between private landowners and the town for the greater good. And there can be ways of incentivizing uh, private landowners to do certain things to work with the town uh, to provide solutions. Uh, so, uh, and, and so I, I think, again, this is another case where we have to all work together to develop a vision um, that includes the private landowners working with the town to make, you know, these kind of ideas come to fruition. Well, thanks, Lee. That was a, a nice way to sort of end this uh, hour and a half we've had together. We do have a few minutes if somebody wants to share any last words. Just like was, to know, go ahead. To hear, to hear, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to hear Ron's uh, thoughts on that bridge from where his parking lot is and if that's something that's, uh, Lee implied it perhaps is inextricably tied up with his ability to to redevelop that downtown area. But I'm just wondering what Ron's feelings are about the possible bridge behind his parking lot there on first. Okay, I'm, I, I'm now unmuted, I believe. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear uh, you now, Ron. Okay, uh, I bought that property when it came up for sale with the idea of a bridge going through there somehow, knowing that sooner or later, maybe not in my lifetime, but sooner or later, uh, there's going to be a recognition that there's a need for it. And that's a, uh, the, I've talked with the town engineers informally. They think it's a great place. They think it's a good idea. And so this is one of the reasons I agree with Lee. You have to look at the whole picture of the downtown area. The, a new bridge there would certainly affect traffic flow. Uh, it would make a difference in terms of how I would redesign uh, the uh, block for utilization. Uh, you wouldn't really want any driveways going onto uh, Snyder Street from a development if uh, you had increased traffic on there. It would be that sort of thing. So uh, this is another case where a lot of things and a lot of moving parts need to be looked at together. And it can be. People seem to think this is a daunting task. It's not. It just takes people sitting down and uh, working together. And I'm I am certainly willing to do it uh, in my lifetime. But I'm not committing anything past my lifetime. That's for sure. Thank you. <laughs> so we only have like another twenty or thirty years, huh, Ron? <laughs> I hope it's fifty. <laughs> This has been a great conversation. It's been very robust. Hopefully everybody feels like they were able to share um, their questions and their comments. And um, we just really appreciate everybody showing up and, and being a part of this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks you. for Good hosting. Night, Thanks everybody. Good night. Everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you.